So without further ado, I would like to introduce Miss Angela Rock. Hi, everyone. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for being with us tonight. It is uh, my honor and privilege to be on my own road to 2020. Um, no, this is not a presidential announcement. Um, but throughout the course of this election so far, it has been so important to me that we're able to have conversations with people who are running for our vote and really need to answer questions about issues that we find most important to us. Some of those, there are, there are tons of commonalities throughout the country on issues that we care most about. And some of them are divergent, and that's okay. So tonight here in Atlanta, Georgia, it is my honor and privilege um, to welcome someone who I've been a fan of for a really long time. Um, well, as he runs for uh, the presidency for 2020, um, he has served um, our first and only black president, Barack Obama, as the secretary of HUD, Housing and Urban Development. And he announced his campaign um, and it's focused on issues near and dear to the hearts of so many of us. Um, he also has a twin brother that we might talk about a little bit tonight. But it is my honor and privilege to introduce to some of you and welcome to so many more, uh, Secretary Julian Castro. Okay, so we're going to get right to it. Oh, Fox News came to see you, Secretary Castro. Look at that. Fox News, just remember the facts, okay? Remember the facts. Remember Hopefully the fa they'll be nice today. Wait, they'll and if nice. they're not, I will have the full tape to run that thing back. So, um, we are going to jump right in. Um, for those of you who have followed the podcast, you know that I do a little ice-breaking round. And it is a rapid response round. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. The first one. This is a, just a preference question. Uh, latte or green tea? Uh, I hate green tea, so latte. <laughs> latte. Okay. Uh, breakfast potatoes or grits? Uh, breakfast potatoes. What? <laughs> Don't kick them out yet, y'all. Don't kick uh -huh. them out yet. All right. Uh, candy yams or mac and cheese? Uh, candied yams. All right, candy you just yams. you yeah. just got your card yeah. back. You candy just yams. you just got candy it. Yams. <laughs> <laughs> trying to recover here. Thank you, thank you. But you better make sure you can eat that. We're gonna be watching for it next. They're bringing you some up. I heard. I'm just kidding. Um, in living color or Martin? Uh, in living color because it launched so many people's careers. <laughs> yeah. It launched okay. so many people's careers. So much talent on the stage. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Ah, uh, this one might be an easy one. Atlanta or Savannah? Uh. <laughs> you would think this would be easy, right? But Savannah is very charming. So I, but Atlanta, because it has it all. Has it all. I said yeah. A Town down. They, they almost kicked us both out for that one. All right. Um, greatest rapper of all time. Uh. <sighs> Tupac. Ah! Okay, you just got points with me. There's some Biggie fans out here real pissed, though. Okay, uh, now I want to do a word association. Word that comes to mind with Andrew Yang? Uh, $1,000 free. <laughs> That's three words, but I'm going to let you go with that. You are on message. Uh, Melania Trump. Quiet. That's true. Um, Democratic primary. Fractured. Um, Stacey Abrams. Talented. Mm. Okay. Dreamers. Aspiring. Mm. Joaquin Castro. <laughs> good looking guy. Good looking guy. <laughs> good look. That guy looks good. Even with that beard. Oh, dang, that was my next one. I was going to say Joaquin Castro's beard. You all, that's trending today, if you haven't noticed. All right, my last one is reproductive rights. Uh, access. Mm. You know, everybody needs them. Okay. Well, you made it through the rapid round. Okay. 
So Fox News is already trying to shut already? us down here. Come on, you yeah. guys. Come on. Um, okay, so one of the, the next things I want to get into is we touched on the Democratic primary in rapid round. What Democratic candidates right now are you the closest to? Um, personally. Well, I mean, I've had uh, good conversations with uh, really mostly with three people mm -hmm. with uh, Corey, because he and I both went to Stanford. Maybe no Stanford grads here. I, He's yeah, like, I expect something. Like something. Just uh, pretend like you did. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, with Kamala, mm -hmm. uh, we've talked on the phone a couple times, and then every time we, time we see each other, we chat, you know. And then with Elizabeth Warren. Okay. Uh, so I've probably talked to Warren the most, but really with those three, I've had a good relationship. I have a good relationship with everybody. I mean, there are 16 other people in it right now. But those are the people that I've talked to the most. Um, when you think about a candidate um, in the field right now that you disagree with the most, who do you disagree with the most? Not personally, but on policy. Like, I don't see there's too much light between our positions. I think it's probably different for the issues. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously, on the debate stage, I made clear my disagreements with Vice President Biden on immigration and on health care. Um, I've also expressed a disagreement uh, with uh, Mayor Buttigieg on some things. Um, yeah, so just different. For, I, you know, I, I think that Andrew Yang's um, approach is a clever approach, and it has some to recommend it. But you know, I don't agree with saying that you're just going to get $1,000, but we're going to take away any kind of other programs that people can access, because I don't think it's simple. So, you know, there are things that I agree with and things I disagree with that folks have said. Um, and since you just brought up um, Vice President Biden, you had a moment two debates ago. Um, and I'm interested to hear your approach. Oh, I remember it. I remember it. I yeah, know you yeah. remember it. I wasn't questioning your recollection. Yeah. But speaking of memory, what happened in this debate is you challenged him on if he remembered what he said just two minutes ago. Uh, when you think about that moment, is there anything about it that you would have said differently? Uh, no, I, I know how they were debating, mm -hmm. uh, what they were suggesting. But in the moment when you're up there debating, you know, I mean, it's responding very quickly. And what I was responding to was that he had denied that he said uh, that people, some people would have to buy into his plan. And so that was kind of my reflexive response. Yeah. You know, it's interesting to me that if my response had been, you know, somebody else on that stage to Corey or to Kamala or to anybody, I don't think that the media would have run with that in the same way. Yeah. And I, you know, I wasn't intending to um, make the claim that the media went with. But what I saw that night was that, you know, what happens when a narrative takes hold and then it just, you know, like just goes. Like wildfire. Yeah. And so, yeah, you're I mean, in fact, to me, one of the interesting things was that. Uh, whether it was the root or another uh, a number of other um, um, minority publications and journalists of color actually gave that moment a more full rendering, right? But you know, the, the MSNBCs of the world, the CNNs of the world, the New York Times, and so forth, there was one narrative, and it's that I had attacked him on his age, mm -hmm. which that was not my intention. Um, so then, would you say you're not an ageist? Of course, yeah. I wanted to give yeah. you that. Yeah, I mean, I have made. It very clear the whole time, right, that I think it's not your age necessarily and it's not even your experience necessarily that is the most important thing. I really think it's somebody's judgment. Somebody can be 80 years old and have great judgment and wisdom. Somebody can be 40 years old and have great judgment. And for voters, I think it's about identifying what is the judgment that people have shown, right? And that's what the whole process is about getting at. If I were just, you know, or when I vote for somebody, right, um, that's what I want to know. Like, what is their judgment and what is their vision for the future? When you um, think about the fact that we're sitting here in Atlanta, um, there is another debate tomorrow. Um, it's one at Tyler Perry Studios who didn't qualify, um, which has to be immensely frustrating. Um, but you have placed a supreme value on the voices and the votes of black people. So you're in Atlanta. 
Um, and I, I do want to give you just a moment. If you had an opening statement tomorrow, um, could you give that opening statement to us in 90 seconds or less? <laughs> you mean practice? No, I would say, look, that, um, that this election is all about the future of our country and how we're going to move from a president who has tried his hardest to divide us to one who's going to try and unite us from a president that wants to make America something again to a time for when a lot of people, again, isn't good because it wasn't that great before. I want to make our country better than it's ever been in the years to come. And I also want to be a president not for some people, but for all people. Uh, I'm going to do that by making sure that no matter who you are, that you and your family can have good health care when you need it, that your child or your grandchild can get a great education so that they can reach their dreams the way that I feel very blessed in my life to have reached my own, and I bet folks here feel the same way, and also so that everybody can have good job opportunities so they can provide for their family and prosper in the years ahead, and that no matter who you are, no matter the color of your skin, how much money you have or don't have, what neighborhood you're growing up in, what the odds are that you have a real meaningful shot at your dream in this country. That's what I would say. Thanks. All right. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what is also very important to me is um, I had a mentor once in high school who used to say all the time, he who defines rules, as it applies to me, she who defines rules. And so he said one of the greatest um, positions of power we can ever have in life is defining ourselves. So when you think about that, who is Julian Castro? Who are you? you know, this is one of those like philosophical slash existential so questions. <laughs> because what yeah. happens, like just so you know, the mm -hmm. re part of the reason why I'm doing these podcasts is I think it's important for people to not just see rhetoric on the debate stage. Sure, sure. Yeah. It's important for people to know who these candidates you know, yeah, like yeah, yeah. No, them. but no, it's it's not to not to demean the question. Yeah, yeah. I don't mean it that way. I mean to say yes, like it takes a little deep. bit more time to you know kind of. Deep. I want to give people an honest answer to yeah. that. If that's not that's not a question you get asked on the campaign trail every single day, and really that's not a question for of me as a candidate. That's a question of me as a human being, right? Um, and so when you ask who am I, uh, you know, I've always thought of myself as a fighter for people that need somebody to fight for them. Um, you know, I grew up with a very particular perspective. I grew up with a mom who was a Chicana activist that was part of the Mexican American Civil Rights Movement. And so I got into public service so that I could help people. Like, I don't believe that that's a bad word. So, you know, when I think about who I am, so to speak, in the context of what we're doing, it's as a fighter to help people to be able to achieve their dreams. I love that. And um, one of the most honest, sincere, and loyal people I have ever met in politics, a true friend. And he talked about um, the critical role that you played um, as the founding class in the Young Elected Officials Network um, and the fact that you've always been engaged. And so um, for the people who are just kind of meeting you on the campaign trail, to have someone who says, you're the most honest person in politics they've met. That's big because we know that politics isn't necessarily for being the honest business. What do you think about that? Oh, uh, well, I'll have to tell Andrew. Thank you. <laughs> Text him. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, and the feeling is very much mutual, first of all, with Andrew. Out of what everything that happened in 2018 and all of the celebration of that night, the most heartbreaking outcome was Andrew coming so close yeah. and not becoming governor. Uh, and I know that he will, if that's what he wants in the future, or president in the future, if he wants to. Um, but I got into politics, like I said, so that I could help other people be able to achieve their dreams in the way that I feel that my brother and I have been able to achieve ours. And I also believe that you, if you're in it, right, that you have to be honest, mm -hmm. that we have way too many examples of um, dishonesty and lack of integrity in the Oval Office, but all the way down, as y'all know, where I grew up at school boards, right, um, in local politics, at least my experience was that too often times in the communities that need honest 
honesty and integrity the most, sometimes you find that the least in our elected officials. And so I wanted to change that. You know, at, at every level, when I was on the city council, when I was mayor, when I was HUD secretary, I, I've tried to conduct myself in, in an honest way and tried to reform the ethics rules and laws uh, and also admit it when I made a mistake. I mean, in 2016, I violated that Hatch Act, you know, the, the one that Kellyanne Conway has like violated 50 times or something. 50 times a day. Yeah. yeah. No, inadvertently, you know, when I was advocating for Secretary Clinton and I mixed my personal role with my professional role. And I said when they brought that to my attention, yeah, no, I made a mistake and I'm going to make sure that it doesn't happen again. And so... I think you have to approach it with honesty and integrity and be big enough to understand when you've made a mistake and then go on, you know? Um, and to that, um, I think one of the things that is also super interesting about not just making a mistake, but in creating pathways um, of opportunity for um, different constituencies, you've taken on um, in your role in this race as someone who is um, a chief racial justice advocate um, in your campaign. Do you feel like that hurt you by taking on issues of race in a, in a climate where they tell us it's the white working class voter, we need to get those Trump voters back? What do you say to that? Is it hurt uh, you? Yeah, I mean, what I see in this election is that is that there's a media narrative, uh, and that may well reflect, you know, a good portion of the voters out there that think that the best way to beat Donald Trump is to appeal to a moderate to conservative base that Donald Trump is popular with and to appeal to the white working class in the Midwest. And look, I think what we need is a nominee that can appeal to everybody. Right? I think what we need to do is that we need to go electrify that Obama coalition from 2008 of uh, people from different backgrounds, young people, uh, older people, working people, in different parts of the country, uh, and that's how we're going to win. The other thing that I pointed out, and and now I've you know other people have pointed out as well, is that folks think about these states that we lost in Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and they think of rural communities. I mean, what powers our base, our votes in Michigan is Detroit. Right? What powers our, our our votes in Wisconsin? A lot of it is Milwaukee in that area, and in in Pennsylvania, it's Philadelphia. And so there are these important constituencies in those states that sort of just in the, in the media narrative, that's just being washed over. And, the, and I have said that I think it's a mistake to only focus on that because what we risk is giving Trump a chance to do the same thing that he did in 2016. He won in part in 2016 because uh, black turnout fell from 66% in 2012 to 59.5% in 2016. And Latino turnout fell from like 48.5% in 2012 to 47% in 2016. So we need somebody that can excite the whole spectrum of, of Americans. So in, in speaking of the whole spectrum of Americans, you recently, um, in comments that I posted on my page, talked about the Democratic primary process um, starting in Iowa and New Hampshire as a way of kind of um, dismissing the role that black women have historically played in the party, saying that, um, thank you, you, you know, you've led the way in these races in 2018 and in some instances in 2016, but we're still going to start in these mostly white states. I know you caught some flack for that, especially in the primary states, but why was that important for you to say in right now? Uh, it was in the vein of what I see as this, this, media narrative, popular thinking about how we should campaign. And also, I mean, like I just see that as a very obvious change that we need to make. And I see it as really a hypocrisy that we're dealing in because Democrats have gone after Republicans, as we should, for suppressing the vote of people of color, right? I mean, I agree with many people who have said that would be governor if Brian Kemp hadn't dumped a whole bunch of people off the rolls and found other ways to suppress their votes, right? I mean, she, she deserves to be governor of Georgia right now. She, she deserves to be governor of Georgia right now. But so what I'm saying is we can't, we can't push and push and push against these Republican efforts. We should, but then just turn around and start 
the most important nominating process in the whole system, the nominating process for president, in these two states that hardly have any black people, mm -hmm. that I think are the third and the fifth or sixth um, uh, whitest states in the whole country. And that we need to find a way to ensure that the values we've espoused of diversity and of recognizing that everybody has a place at the table for that to be reflected in our presidential nominating process. Iowa has had its caucus since 1972. We've changed a lot as a country in almost 50 years. We've changed a lot as a Democratic Party. I mean, think about that. 1972. Think about the timing of that. I mean, we're here at past goals that this historic spot for so many of the conversations that shaped and the action that shaped the civil rights movement. 1972 was right after the black community really had moved fully over into the Democratic Party. Shirley Chisholm was running for president that year in 72. And, and then, all of a sudden in 72, the nominating process starts with the Iowa caucus, which even today is 90% white. I mean, what sense does that make? Didn't make sense then, and it certainly does not make sense in 2020, almost 50 years later. And I'll tell you, Angela, I mean, it's fascinating. I mean, this, this has been more taboo for me to say this, yeah. for me to tell people in Iowa and in New Hampshire, hey, 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 you know, maybe we should let other states have their turn. That's more taboo than arguing for Medicare for all or, you know, we need to, we need to redo or we need a, a, you know, revamp of our tax code or anything like that. I mean, I told folks the other day, if you are a Democrat and the most important thing to you is that your state gets to go first in how we nominate a president. I mean, you know, I, I think that we can do better than that. And so I, th I actually believe that in the years to come, we will. I was very heartened to see yesterday in the Cedar Rapids Gazette, there were six or seven people from Iowa, uh, who, including the chair of the rural caucus of the Iowa Democratic Party, that wrote an op-ed saying yes, we actually do need to change this. Wow. So a little bit, there's, there's support even in Iowa and New Hampshire. I, I don't wanna paint everybody with the same brush. Right. There is sub substantial support even within those states of people who recognize that we need to do it differently. What so. state do you think should go first? Uh, well, look, I know there have been- Texas wouldn't be bad. <laughs> 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 no, no, look, I, there are different ways to analyze it, right? Yeah. So it's not my place to say, look, take this state first. Um, I think what should happen is that people from different parts of the country and of diverse backgrounds should get together at the DNC uh, and they should put a process in place. That process should look like this. It should say, okay, what states reflect the diversity of the party? Also, of course, there should be a consideration of, you know, how big is a state because it's true. You know, the smaller the state, the more somebody that doesn't have all the money in the world is often able to compete. Does it have a good mix of rural and urban, right? Um, and, and this is what I would add that a lot of folks have not talked about. If we really believe that, that states should have pre-registration, that they should have uh, absentee vo voting, uh, early voting, in other words, if we believe that they should put all these things in place, why don't we reward the states that actually have done that? So that we're living by our values. Those are reflected in our nominating process. And then come up, put all of that you know, into the hopper, and then come up with a rank order of these states, and then allow them to take turns every now and then so that it's not always the same state. Because I will say that what's developed in Iowa and New Hampshire, and it's not their fault. I mean, this, this happens if you have the same states to go all the time is there's a cottage industry in the media, in business, political consultants that exist because of the fact that they go first, right? And maybe more detrimental to policymaking is that there are certain business interests that exist sharply in those states that have a greater hold on American politicians because they go first. I've gotten asked more about ethanol in Iowa than I ever have about mass transit, you know, or transportation, or other big blockbuster issues. Now, we should answer questions about ethanol, right? 
but I also think that having it there over and over again produces a strength in those industries that is out of proportion, right? And that we need to look at that and that switching the states around would help with that. You, you hit on um, voter suppression um, in talking about this. This is uh, almost a democratic version of voter suppression, at least it could be, uh, because we're silencing voices from the outset who are the base and the foundation and the most loyal parts of the party. Um, when you think about what's happening from an election security lens, um, knowing I think there are at least three bills the House has sent over to the Senate for consideration to ensure voting machines are up to par and all of that, why isn't that a bigger issue right now, especially when we think about all of the challenges that the party has in galvanizing voters, newer voters, um, folks who maybe for the first time are registering? Um, should this be a bigger priority? Should we be talking about election security more, given what happened in 16 and 18? Uh, yeah, I mean, and to their credit, as you know, Democrats in Congress yeah. have forwarded, have moved legislation on this. And Mitch McConnell keeps saying that he's going to do something. First, he said he wasn't. Then I think he said he would do something about it to fund the necessary investments that we need to make in election security. I believe what we need is we need a national cybersecurity standard to protect the integrity of our elections uh, from a cyber defense perspective. And then also, we need to update all the equipment and everything out there. I mean, y'all have gone to people have gone to vote, and you go to vote, and some counties they have <clears throat> new machines. Um, with a paper ballot, you know, auditable paper ballot. Now my home county, Bear County in Texas that has San Antonio has that. Others, you know, you're, you're going off ancient um, election equipment. We need to standardize that, at least standardize it by state, if not nationally. But that's going to take an investment of resources from the states and the federal government. So, yes, and I actually, we do get asked that. Yeah. We do get asked that on the campaign trail plenty of times about election security. You're right that it hasn't been something really that's come up much on the debate stage or as a hot button issue. I think probably because that's something that um, folks assume, you know, is is not super controversial within the Democratic primary or for whatever reason. Yeah. Um, in the last debate, um, you mentioned someone's name who had pricked, pricked the hearts of so many in my community and you were the only candidate to do so. It was a Tatiana Jefferson um, at the debate in October. Why did you see that as important to address? You called her out by name, and the question wasn't about her. But you saw it as an important thing to do. Why? Because I wanted to make a point. Uh, the conversation that we were having, that we've been having about a mandatory gun buybacks, and whether that would be like a door-to-door -door approach, trying to actually get people's guns back, I said that one of the reasons that I didn't didn't think that was the best approach is, and this hadn't been part of the conversation, is because in communities like that I grew up in, I imagine a lot of communities that folks here grew up in, like we weren't looking for a reason to, for police to go banging on your door. <laughs> you didn't need another reason for folks to go banging on your door. And I used the example of what happened to Tatiana Jefferson, and that had just happened maybe a week before or so in Fort Worth in her own home where a police officer did not announce himself and then shot her and killed her through her window. Didn't announce himself within four seconds, shot her and killed her through her window. And they said that, they said that there was a weapon there. You know, and somebody pointed out, okay, well, if you're gonna have a, a handgun for home defense <laughs> and you hear somebody prowling around your property at two in the morning, they don't announce themselves as a police officer you know, isn't, isn't that what that self-defense is for then? But they didn't bring that up in the context of Tatiana Jefferson. If that had been somebody else, they would have brought that up. Y'all right. know that, right? Yeah. So my point was, hey, we have to think about these things through the lens of people who have a different experience here. And I, I also, you know, have very much spoken to the issue of excessive force by police and not just spoken to it, I also have put forward a plan uh, on how we can uh, end uh, police brutality and misconduct in our country. Um, you also, um, not just speaking about Tatiana Jefferson, but you've seen, again, racial justice as a core part of your campaign. You have a black woman as your campaign manager. 
How much has um, her role led to you being more thoughtful about issues around racial justice, or were you all already aligned that she's like, that's why that's going to be my problem? Oh, no. I mean, Maya has been wonderful. Yeah, I mean, Maya has been fantastic in every way in the campaign in helping to shape our approach on policy, on the politics of it, all of that. I mean, of course, you know, we're in agreement. You know, if, I, if I'm the candidate and I'm going to go up there and say what I want to say and comfortable with, but there's no question that Maya has helped to um, ensure that concerns about racial justice are always at the forefront and that we don't sell them short. Because the truth is that, especially in today's politics, and with the voter that the media have in mind, the easiest thing to do is to paper over these issues. In some, in some ways, I've felt like um, we're addressing concerns that were very hot in 2016, but for whatever reason, people want to forget about in 2020. Like they just want to sort of sweep it off to the side, but that folks out there have to deal with every single day of their lives. And so it doesn't change from 2016 to 2020. And if we don't address it in 2020, it just gets worse and worse and worse. Knowing that she's played such a pivotal role, Maya's played such a pivotal role to you on your campaign, mm -hmm. um, I want to ask you about a cabinet if there was a black woman that you would put in your cabinet, who would it be and in what role? Uh, well, first of all, I believe... Why are y'all like, ooh, like, really? Come on, like, <laughs> this is a good question. I, there are a number of different people, yeah. um, you know, that uh, of talent. I, you know, I think about folks I worked with when I was HUD secretary, like Terry Sewell, mm. who's brilliant, who's done great work. Yeah. You know, I think about... Stacey Abrams, who I think will one day be president, vice president, whatever she wants to be, right? Uh, I think about uh, Karen Bass, who's very accomplished and today is uh, heading up uh, the Congressional Black Caucus. So there are a number of different people that I would consider for my cabinet, people of talent, uh, of experience, that would lend um, a powerful voice to the work that they're doing and, and who really believe in the mission of their organization. But one of the saddest things about um, what we see in the Trump administration is the people that are in those positions, whether it's Rick Perry at Energy and he forgot that department of the three <laughs> departments that <laughs> he wanted to do away. Run or, that tape back, y'all. That was bad. <laughs> or Dr. Carson that succeeded me at HUD. Oh, I had you know? a Ben Carson question. <laughs> there you go. I mean, who, of course, like you know, in many ways, very accomplished in medicine and, you know, I'm we sure is a nice man. It at that. I'll say it. You don't have to say it. <laughs> we should have left All his right. ass, right? there you know, in medicine. But my problem, Retired. you know, my issue with him is that he seems to think that if you're poor, there's something wrong with you. Yeah. I don't believe that if somebody's poor, there's something wrong with them. Like, I don't believe in, um, in scapegoating people who are poor. Uh, and Can so I tell they you don't something? believe in the mission of the organization. Can I tell you something? I know somebody must have, you have a great team. Somebody properly briefed you on my last question to Elizabeth Warren about the cabinet because you gave me three people. That was her question. Your question was, one black woman in what role? So you start with Terry Sewell. Where would you put her in your cabinet? Oh, I think there are a number of different places that I would put. Anyone. Uh, uh, <laughs> Just one. Secretary of, of um, Commerce, Secretary oh. of Transportation, um, Stacy, either Vice yes. President, uh, Secretary of State. I think a number of different positions. We just got an announcement also, today. Did y'all catch that? Did y'all catch that? Stacy. You know, very you. talented and, and have experience that is, you know, uh, multi leveled and, uh, you know, would do a great job in a I number have, of different I positions. I have one more super black question for you, and that is <laughs> <laughs> that is, it is our 400th year here. Um, and you were one of the first candidates to. Oh, I'm, am I, I'm giving him a lot of firsts today. Have y'all noticed this? Look it up. I'm not lying to you. Fox News, I'm not lying to you either. There's a Fox News mic up here. Um, reparations. Yeah. Um, President Obama, who you served under, didn't want to address reparations in either term, right? Was very uncomfortable with, he kind of couldn't. Well, I would argue he couldn't. As a black man, he's having a hard enough time getting his agenda across. But what we also can't do is not talk about reparations or move the needle on that. You've moved the needle on that. What do you think, um, briefly, because I know we have student questions, 
Um, what do you think a successful plan looks like? I think a successful plan for reparations in this country begins with the legislation that Sheila Jackson Lee, Congresswoman Jackson Lee out of Houston, uh, has put forward. I think it's uh, HB or HR 40. HR 40. HR 40, um, which would create a commission that would then look at reparations and make a recommendation to the Congress, to the president on how we should move forward. To me, success would also look like ultimately finding a way to compensate the descendants of slaves um, and also do some of the things that other candidates have talked about, which is more broadly make investments in education and job opportunities and other things, but would also include specific compensation. That's my view. Um, but the last thing I'll say about that is I also don't believe that if we're ever going to accomplish that, it can't be just one person, even if that's the president, one person's view of how it should turn out. You all know that, um, you know, in this country, we spend a lot of time tap dancing around race still. A lot of, a lot of conversations that never happen because people, you know, they think they're going to be too uncomfortable, right, inconvenient. They don't want to get into them. And people often ask, like, or sometimes they ask, like, you know, like, why, why are you talking about reparations? Number one, I believe that w there's a moral debt that we have not paid, and there's an actual debt that we have not paid to families. But third, I also believe that we have to face it head on mm -hmm. once and for all. And that to everybody, no matter who you are, no matter when your family got here, no matter if the color of your skin is white or brown or if you're Asian American or Native American, African American, whoever you are, um, that it's going to allow us to more fully heal as a country and then move forward. And that that will have benefits far beyond what we can imagine even now. Because I think it'll allow us to move forward truly as more as one nation. And, and that's why I support it for those different reasons. Um, thank you for that. I, uh, I have one last question. Um, your dad, in an article earlier this year, talked about um, politics bringing you all closer together. Um, I know you all have spoken about, um, openly about your dad not being present in the home after you were eight. Um, and so really just wanting to know what reconnecting has looked like for you, for you and your brother. Um, but how did that, how did that come? Where do you see it going? Yeah, yeah, my brother Joaquin and I grew up um, from after the age of eight with my mom and my grandmother, but my parents were together for the first eight years, but they never married. Uh, but they met when uh, they were both active in the Chicano movement. They met in 1968. And what was so fascinating is that my dad kind of burned out on it. He was a school teacher, public school teacher for 31 years. And after a few years, he kind of got out. Of, you know, he still followed politics, but he was not active in the same way, whereas my mother kept going. And, um, but when Joaquin and I got into politics, um, it was an opportunity, I think, also for my dad to be a part of our campaigns, the things that we were doing. Now, we had had something of a relationship with him. Uh, you know, we saw him from time to time. They, because they were not married, like there was no uh, formal custody arrangement. There was no child support either. Um, but, but we did see him sometimes, so it's not like we never saw him. But I do think that we had an opportunity, as people do as they grow older, right? I mean, I think that's one of the beauties of growing up, is that you're able to, as an adult, kind of, you know, um, take relationships and turn them into what you want them to be, right? You're not as much at the mercy of, of what happened in the past or other people. Uh, you know, I, we have a stronger relationship with my father now. Okay. All right. So, thank you all so much. Um, before we depart, um, we gave you the opportunity to have your debate opening. You all want to hear his debate closing? Yeah. Well, Secretary Castro. All, Angela, let's give it up for Angela. She's always a great interviewer. Thank you. Uh, look, to all of the interns, thank y'all. Thank y'all for making everything run so smoothly today. Uh, and Besides to everybody who came mics. here. Uh, <laughs> except, except the static. Uh, uh, to everybody who came out here. Look, um, you know, we're at a very crucial moment in our campaign. Uh, I'm not going to be on that debate stage tomorrow night. But the fact is that even though I'm not there, 
we've already influenced the debate that's taking place in our party. If they get asked a question about housing tomorrow, it'll be because we've kept speaking to the affordability crisis that we have in communities like Atlanta and others throughout the country and demanding that a housing question be asked at these debates. If they talk about immigration, it's clear that other candidates have moved their position because of the strong positive vision that I put forward on immigration. If they talk about police reform and accountability, it's because we brought it up first and actually put out a plan. And if they talk about communities that need things as basic as clean water, it may be because I went to Flint first in this 2020 cycle and then put forward a plan on how we can make sure that things like Flint never happen again, that we eliminate lead as a major public health threat. I want a country where every single person can prosper, where everyone counts. And we have an America where each and every person is able to reach their dreams, no matter who you are. Thank you very much.